Whenever I'm teaching on some aspect of the New Testament, I always place that idea or question within the larger perspective of the history of the New Testament. I think this is one of the most useful tools for interpreting the New Testament or answering questions about it. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in graduate level studies and seminary and bring it to anyone, anywhere on the internet via YouTube. So if you find these videos useful and informative, please give them a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and let other people know about it by smashing that share button underneath and sending them a link. Thanks. In my video on the history of the Bible in 20 minutes, I mentioned how the history of the New Testament is just a narrow sliver of that history, only 100 years at the very most of over a 2,000 year history. If we zoom in on that narrow sliver of history, that 90 to 100 year time frame of the New Testament, a lot happens in that time frame. So let's zoom in and take a look at what takes place during those 100 years. What we're interested in here is from the birth of Jesus up until let's say 80 or 90 AD. But I'm gonna back up a little bit before this because this helps us to understand the stage onto which Jesus is born. In my last video, The History of the Bible in 20 Minutes, I talked about how in 160 AD, the Seleucid Empire, Antiochus Epiphany, offered a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. This set off Israel's revolt against the Seleucid Empire, and they ultimately won their freedom from the Seleucids. However, in 63 AD, when the Roman Empire expanded and conquered the remnants of the Seleucid Empire, they annexed both Israel and Syria into the empire. Israel was no match at all for the Roman Empire, and it quickly got swallowed up by them. Herod the Great was born into the royal family of Israel, and after winning support and approval from Rome, he was thrown king of Israel in 34 BC. He was a ruthless ruler who tolerated no threats to his throne. On the other hand, he is called Herod the Great because of the phenomenal building programs that he went on to rebuild Israel. Starting in Jerusalem, which include the temple, the Antonia fortress, a palace, a theater, an amphitheater, and fortifications around Jerusalem. He also paid for the building of Sephora, a city in Galilee, Tiberias along the Sea of Galilee, and Caesarea, a major port down along the Mediterranean Sea. He also did major projects in the city of Samaria. These are four major urban centers that would have brought jobs and wealth to those regions. He also strengthened Israel by building a number of forts, Masada, Macarius, Hycarnia, Cyprus, Alexandria. He also built three palaces down near Jericho and one south of Jerusalem, Herodium. It's into this context that Jesus is born somewhere between 6 to 4 BC. Why not the year zero? Well, because Matthew specifically tells us that Joseph and Mary and Jesus had to flee to Egypt and remain there until Herod the Great had died. And we know this takes place in 4 BC. Like many ancient rulers, Herod left no clear successions to his throne. Rather, Rome divided his empire among his three sons. Archelaus inherited Judea and Samaria, Herod Antiochus inherited Galilee and the Transjordanian region, and Philip was made tetrarch of the region of Galilee. Archelaus proved to be a very poor ruler and was deposed by Rome, and a governor was appointed over Judea and Samaria, Pilate. I also want to add on to our time frame the period when most of the disciples were probably born. Now, if they're a little bit younger or close in age to Jesus, this would have been somewhere between 0 and 10 AD. Now, this is going to prove to be important when we get towards the end of this video. Forensic anthropologists have studied ancient graves during the first century, and their research has shown that the average man lived to the ripe old age of 35 to 40 years old. Before all you women are shocked about the average lifespan for a man, you should also realize that the golden age for a woman was the ripe old age of 27 to 30 years old. So the next time you hear someone complain that old age is not for sissies, remind them of the life expectancy of the 12 disciples. Probably most of them died between 40 to 50 AD, though a couple would have lived longer. John, for example. 
but I'm gonna come back to that later. It seems like I've fallen into a rut here. My last three videos have all been heavy on the graphics and animation side. So if you find these charts and graphics useful, please leave a comment down below underneath this video because I'm thinking I need to reduce my dependence on them, but we shall see. If the New Testament occupies a narrow slice of biblical history, then the actual ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus is even a narrower slice. Only about three years of the 90 years that we're looking at in this video, or only three years of over 2,000 years of the entire biblical history. Now I've got a little blue column here to represent the three years of Jesus' life, but it's really the final seven days which occupy the greatest amount of space in the Gospels. If John is 21 chapters long, you need to realize that by chapter 12, he is already into the last seven days of Jesus' life. It's the message of Jesus' death and resurrection that then launches the rest of the New Testament's historical trajectory. This brings us to the book of Acts. The book of Acts covers about 30 to 35 years. It opens in 33 AD with the day of Pentecost and the church is born with the descent of the Holy Spirit. About two years after this, Stephen is martyred and one of those present is Saul who would then convert a short time later. After his conversion, Saul would adopt the Greek co-name of Paul. It's at this point that Luke shifts his focus as the author of the book of Acts from sort of a general history of the apostles in Jerusalem to Paul's journeys and his ministry. Most likely because Luke accompanied and ministered with Paul. Almost half of the book of Acts is devoted to Paul's missionary journeys. Now, Paul's first missionary journey probably occurs between 48 to 49 AD, the second one from 50 to 52 AD, and his third journey from 53 to 57 AD. I need to add a caveat here. These dates are approximate. They can vary by a few years on either side, and I've revised my dates, for example, this timeline several times over the years. We try to determine these dates by doing detective work and looking for clues in the text to help us pin down some of these dates. You don't have to agree with my dates. In fact, I would encourage you to take my timeline and modify it for yourself, changing the times and dates to see how you best see all this fitting together. And I'll have a link underneath this video to a Dropbox where you can download this timeline. But I digress back to our timeline here. The book of Acts closes with Paul being arrested when he visits Jerusalem. He's imprisoned then in Caesarea, he appeals to Caesar, and then is sent off and he's imprisoned in Rome. So if Luke and Acts are written together, that would give us a latest date, possibly around 60 to 65 AD, the time of Paul's first imprisonment. This brings us to the dating of some of the New Testament books that we can then layer on top of our timeline of these historical developments and facts. So let's add another layer of information over top of our timeline here. First and second Thessalonians are widely agreed to be the first books or letters that Paul wrote. One of the things to realize is that the New Testament is not organized chronologically. Rather, the books are grouped in sort of a thematic type fashion. The accounts of Jesus' life where the gospels are first. The book of Acts then makes a nice transition from the Gospels to the letters, and I have a video about why Luke is separated from Acts with the Gospel of John in the middle there. Then we have Paul's letters, which are more or less organized from longest to shortest. Then after that, we have the Catholic or universal letters. These are letters written by other authors besides Paul, Hebrews, James, Jude, John's letters, and so on. And the New Testament closes with the big final fireworks grand finale of the book of Revelation. But I digress. Let's get back to our timeline here. Galatians is probably written shortly after 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, somewhere between, let's say, 48 to 50 AD. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are written between, let's say, 52 and 55 AD, and then the letter of Romans shortly after them. Nailing down letters written by the other authors of the New Testament is a little bit trickier. With Paul's letters, we can kind of compare them with the book of Acts and see where they fall. With these other letters, it's rather tricky at times. Now, James is considered one of the earliest letters. And the reason for this is because when he talks about the church, he uses the word synagogue. 
probably indicating that the early Christians were still worshiping in the Jewish community and that the rift between the two groups had not developed yet. Mark is probably the earliest of all the Gospels written, somewhere around 50 AD. And Jude falls into this early time frame as well. But like James, it's very hard to pin down a date for its composition. And I've seen dates for Jude as early as, let's say, 48 AD, and as late as, say, 150 AD. That's a very, very hard letter to pin down. What happens after the book of Acts closes? Well, from early church fathers and other sources, we have some pretty good idea when several events took place. James, the brother of Jesus, who assumed leadership within the church in Jerusalem, is martyred around 62 AD. Peter, somewhere around 64 to 65 AD, is crucified upside down in Rome. And Paul is arrested a second time, sent to Rome, and will then be executed somewhere between 65 to 68 AD. This is an arrest and a trial that's not recorded in the book of Acts. The 800-pound gorilla in the room that needs to be addressed is what happens in Israel around this time. In 68 AD, and I've got this in sort of the dark pink here, Israel rebels against Rome. They most likely picked this time because there was a succession of leadership in Rome, and they thought that there was a leadership vacuum at that time. Unfortunately, their attempt was crushed. In 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed and burnt to the ground. The people of Israel are carried off into slavery, and the temple is pillaged. Israel as a nation really ceases to exist at this time. In fact, the Arch of Titus that is in Rome really commemorates Rome's sacking of Israel. Now on one side, inside this arch, you have the portrayal of the conquering army with Nike, the goddess, standing behind the general. On the opposing side, you have a depiction of the Roman army carrying off the loot from the temple, most significantly the menorah lampstand from within the temple. If Paul is executed somewhere around, let's say, 68 AD, then this is a really narrow window from when the book of Acts closes until his execution. And there's a number of letters of his that fall within this time frame. These include Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, his letters to his disciples, Timothy and Titus. It's around this time frame that other New Testament authors really get busy as well. The Gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke are written during this time. First Peter, Hebrews, John's letters and the book of Revelation. So why this prolific outpouring of writing during this period of time? I think one of the main reasons why so much of the New Testament gets written between, let's say, 50 to 70 AD is for two reasons. First, when you read the earliest letters like 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and Jesus' teachings in the Gospels, you really get the impression that Jesus is coming soon, like maybe next Friday. And as a result, the church lived with an expectation that the end was just around the corner. As time dragged on, the early church began to take a longer game approach. And you can really see this within Paul's letters. His earliest letters have a heavy emphasis on Jesus' imminent return. But some 10 to 15 years later, around 60 to 65 AD, he's taken a longer approach to the Christian life. Second, as the first generation of disciples begin to die out. Remember, I told you this was going to be important earlier. If they are born between 0 to 10 AD, by the time we hit 50 AD, they are now old men at 40 years old, most likely well past their sell-by date. As they begin to pass away, there's a need to preserve their teachings, and the best way to do this is by committing their teachings to writing. So let's wrap this up. A lot happens in this short time frame, and we could add hundreds of other details to this timeline as well. While the central point of all this time frame really revolves around the final seven days of Jesus' life and then his resurrection, we need to understand the broader strokes of history to have some perspective on what's going on. Hopefully this will help you to have a big picture view of the New Testament history. This is an incredibly dense period of history that still impacts us today. And it's why so many people spend so much of their lives studying this period of history. Hopefully you'll be encouraged to dive into this period of history more on your own as well. Till then, peace.